And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to coming to us straight from the same time zone as me, thank goodness, Can, hail... Hailing from hailing from the hailing from the lost the lost lands known as Wisconsin, my eternal nemesis. <laughs> and the, and the Vikings. <laughs> Arr, I'm, a, I'm a bear fan anyway, so you can keep those Packers too. Pack oh, it up, bear down. Look, the last time the last time I was in last time I was anywhere near Lambeau Field, I got pulled over for sobriety. Aha! Uh -huh. Shame <laughs> on you. Yeah, my blood alcohol level was too was too low. I got, Ab uh, absolutely. Well, that's but, because you were drinking Grain Belt. It doesn't have any uh, toxicity to it. Joke's on you. I was drinking Summit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the one and only Ernie Gygax, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. How you how you doing today, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. If you hear any whining, that'll be my dog in the background saying throw toys. Otherwise, everything's under control. Uh, it's Casey is she who must be obeyed. <laughs> yeah, I know I know that my um what um one of the people in one of the guys in my house has has a has a dog who is frankly speaking a bit of a brat. Well, hopefully someday it'll bite a burglar. <laughs> It'd be wonderful. Um, <laughs> Even if it's in the ankle. <laughs> although although at the very least at the very least it's good is good at it's good at scaring off the door to door people. Usually, I, usually I have to do that myself with an air horn. Oh, really? <laughs> I fig oh. I figure the best I figure the best way to get or get rid of somebody that that persistent is to be as annoying as possible. So when they're doing when they're standing there doing their speech, I'm just occasionally blowing a whistle and throwing them off. <laughs> I, I thought maybe, um, but would that work against a land shark? Are you too young to know about land sharks? I know I know about I know about land sharks. I've just never had to deal with them. The worst I've had to deal with is door to door salesmen or Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> That's what I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. So I was as a little kid coming to your door, mm -hmm. looking and desperately saying, "Don't be rude," <laughs> but at the same time, don't try to force me to talk a long time. I want to get this over with. My mom's mm -hmm. behind me. <laughs> it was it was pretty tough to do that kind of stuff as a kid. Yeah, um, and of course, of course, I remember. Of course, I I distinctly remember seeing piles and piles of of um awake mag awake magazines in the mail in the mailbox whenever I'd go whenever I'd be out of town for a while. <laughs> I'd come, wow! I'd come back and there's half a dozen half a dozen of them. Well, that means someone had put you down as somebody interested or somebody that had been interested because the the people there actually have to buy the awake magazines. So it's there. It's costing them money to leave that. It's it's not an organization doing that. The organization, you know, it's not a bunch of money, but they're they're paying something for those. So I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. not the same as a junk man completely. It, yeah. They're they're uh, they're well-meaning idiots, or at least cult followers, or whatever you want to say. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot a lot better than say maybe a motorcycle gang or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dig down that ra that particular rabbit hole. Now, okay. you have cut. You have cut your teeth on on, fa panzer on, fancy, division. on huh? On a Panzer division. <laughs> on... As, as a little kid, uh, there was a SS Panzer division in the Stalingrad game. That's my first yeah. item. I was cutting my teeth on mm -hmm. a game between Gary Gygax and uh, Dan Megiddo. Mm -hmm. So, but I do, but. I do. I do want. Normally, when I do this kind of thing, I open up. I open up with, with the with the humble beginnings and what and what made it stick. But in your case, because of because of the experience that you have, I want to. Inst I want to instead take a spin on that and ask in your in from your viewpoint, what is it about um, fantasy gaming, and to a certain and to a certain extent, war gaming, since they're since they are kind of joined at the hip. That draws people to it. Um, I believe it has to do with imagination, and we all wish for more. Right now, my my hound at my side wishes that her legs work better. She's old. 
and then I'd throw more toys, and we only ate steak. But you know, with a fantasy world, things can be beautiful, but then at a certain point, things would it, it would become boring like anything else. Mm -hmm. So somehow, like with Dungeons and Dragons or other items, there's always obstacles and there's rewards. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's it's much better than going and punching in at a, a factory and working a die all day or, you know, pressing a button or mm -hmm. picking up this heavy thing and moving that along. Uh, with with my father, he, he created this item not by himself, but he created it as being an enthusiast of pulp magazines, of being a chess player, of going to chess clubs of having experienced life and doing things mm -hmm. and then, but not being all that he experienced while being fat with glasses <laughs> and nerdy. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all of a sudden he's, he's had to do a lot of alone time and just have his own special friends. And these are the people that also would have felt ostracized. And at some point he he would as they would talk and they would make up games. In fact, my father's first example of a role playing game was Big J uh, John Rash giving mm -hmm. them assignments, and it was uh, amateur detective. Mm -hmm. And he gave them each an empty old wallet and put in some fake money. And he would with with these watches and things and say, "Okay, you've got two hours here. Let's synchronize our watches and go tell me a story about what's happening down at the Riviera Beach." And he'd send these kids out and he would pay them in these vouchers and they would do experiences and they'd report back. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a, a role play. All right. But that's just to show that role playing has always existed as it is on theater because a lot of the best shots and things like this are not just completely following the script. Some of it's ad lib. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're really good, then they praise you. And if you're an amateur, you get thrown off the stage. But it's a, it's, or unless you're extremely well received. It's fun. It's funny you mention. It's funny you mention that that kind of thing because there's two there's two bits of anecdotes I have re regarding that and my own experiences. One, um, even among the nerd cr nerd crowd, I was the I was the odd man out because you've got a lot of people who were who were f who were sh who definitely fit the archetype. And meanwhile, I'm I was never a short man. <laughs> Even even as a even as a kid, I was t I was tall enough to the to the point where I had to, I had to keep telling people that I was actually under eighteen at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm surprised you weren't very popular. They keep trying to get you to go into the stores all the time. Get some cigarettes. Get some beer. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's because well, that's because what I well what I do a few times what I do a few times is I'd say oh, okay, give me the money and I'll do, and I'll do it, and then I would just take the money and just and then just not come back. Ah, neutral act. <laughs> no, no, not not necessarily. Some might say it's neutral. Some might say it's evil. I was also the same guy who, when somebody was asking me for answers on a test, I would give them answers I knew were wrong, just to see if they tried and cry foul about it. And some people did. And they okay. and, I, and I'd usually tell them, "Well, you asked me, you asked me for answers. You didn't ask for the right answer." Oh, I see. So, so you were one of those guys that'd be like me and Ken. Oh, can I get up? Sure, you can. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm getting up. Well, I didn't. You didn't ask permission. That kind of crap. My dad yeah. did that at our um, dinner table. <laughs> I get. I ripped a lot of those ideas from watching Abbott and Costello growing up. Well, and maybe he did too, but he's enforced it on me growing up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the the uh, appreciation of puns as well. Yeah. The um, so you can you can imagine all the, you can imagine that that there were some weird looks at at first when everybody's a bunch of five foot nothings in a, in in a in a room full of nerds and then somebody comes in who's six one. Okay, and, now were you actually physical at all, or were you a, a, a nerd stick? Um, I w I was I was certainly I was certainly fit I was certainly physical. I had done I had done my fair. I did I did my fair share of sports, but I did the see sport, but I did the sports that the rest of the family didn't want me to do. Everybody wanted me to do basketball, and I did hockey. Oh wow! So you're actually pretty tough, because that's 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 not a wimp sport. Well, that that and I um I got in my I got in my fair share of, I got in my fair share of scuffles, and I w and I was given very simple instructions. Hey, Mildred, you see that guy with the puck? Yes, I do, sir. I don't want to fix that. 
okay. <laughs> and then I go, and then I go, then I go in there, and then I bowl, and then I bowl him over like a bo- like a bowling ball. Um, Did you end up in the penalty box? Yes. <laughs> okay. Espe- so you were. <laughs> espe- especially, especially since um, I ended, I ended up, pull, I ended up pulling a, pa- I ended up pulling a page out of Rob Ray. Um, yeah, I thought I thought maybe that you know you're you are definitely a special teams player. Okay, we we need no. to bruise their superstar and take away the puck. What do we do? <laughs> Send in Mongo. <Yeah. laughs> Never mind that shit. Here comes Mongo. <laughs> but the th- but the um with that with that kind of with that kind of things I've um. I've had the pleasure of of, of speaking with sev- several of the other um, TSR alums o- over the years, and kind of developed a um, a bit a bit of a cro- a bit of a chronological affair in in my head regarding D and D's various incarnations. Um, but one one of the bl- one of the blanks for for me is has been the um, the transition. I wouldn't say transition, but the ad the advent I guess I'll use my th- my thesaurus is failing me at the moment between or between origin between original and the appearance of um, advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Well, see at that point, I was specializing in all the retail sections of TSR. Mm-hmm. I had the dungeon hobby shop, or I had the dungeon mail order. I had the dungeon distributors, which was really part of the mail order, but it would, mm-hmm. uh, and that was the old bowling alley underneath. Um, and I had the role playing game association with Frank Menser working for me, mm-hmm. as well as Gen Con with uh, Skip Williams and Dave Conant. Mm-hmm. Um, all kinds of other people came came around at different times. Uh, we had 20 full-time and two part-time. Um, when we start talking about the game itself, uh, even my dad was playtesting all these new rules here and there. So we would we would check out things and see how they worked. And, I mean, at some point, though it may not have been at the earliest stages, we were checking out Psionics because we'd all reread Hyrule's Journey mm-hmm. by Sterling Lanier. And we're gung ho for them to work. Plus, we played in Jim Ward's Metamorphosis Alpha game a lot, mm-hmm. and that was good fun. Yeah, I've, real fun. I've um, obviously I've never I haven't been face to face with him, but Jim, but Ward has Ward has been a honored guest here here in the temple in the past. Um, yeah. And now, take, taking that into account, the I would like to ask a bit about the. The for, the um early days of of the R, of the RPGA, which okay. for all intents and purposes is the for, is the if not the then one of the earliest examples of tr- of trying to do organized play with this kind of format. Obviously, there had been organized play when with um wargaming for years up to that point. But how? But who? Um, can you recall who pitched the idea to do the RPGA and how did and how it got started? Yes, it got pitched right from the top. My dad created it. And he he created this thing and he said, I want this to be set up and I think it's gonna work good and mm-hmm. this'll and I wanna pass this on and have this be under you again, Brian, mm-hmm. because we you can go ahead and put this under my son. But we need someone to actually be the department head and to do all the real work. Ernie mm-hmm. will be more the filter trying to keep him from constantly bothering us but still passing through the important ideas and us giving whatever resources back. Mm-hmm. All right. So I'm just trying to say what my job was, except for every once in a while pitching and throw boxes or being rah, rah, or adding resources to some other area mm-hmm. where I peel every other man away from somewhere else. And we <laughs> rush over here and do something. <laughs> but um, I'm sorry. I, you know, I keep on thinking more as, as the managerial at that time. I had, mm-hmm. I, I was no. I had to wear a suit and tie, <laughs> and, uh, and we would have competitions on who had the best ties and count the stripes in our ties and things like this. Were, it, were any of you wearing clip-ons because it's, because it's a no, pain? Oh. No, 
No, no, no, no. We tied our own ties. Well, I guess there might have been a few people that weren't, but they weren't playing. They weren't the – I was also at that time, I was in my, my youth. Mm-hmm. So this is this is me. I just gotten through with a first relationship. I'd, I'd lost that fat that she put on me because I was working out hard, mm-hmm. and I knew what I wanted. <laughs> so I started working out, playing racquetball constantly, and, and got fit and also did well at TSR. So I was having a lot of fun because mm-hmm. we had, at the top, 367 employees Mm -hmm. and we didn't have any rules in place where you couldn't you know date your co-members in fact several marriages occurred because of working at tsr Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it was it wasn't everybody wasn't paranoid and it wasn't like may i please come into your space (laughs) (laughs) i wouldn't want to ruffle your feathers um now you meant you mentioned you mentioned psionics earlier which is interesting to me because I had I have heard my fair share of stories, and some of the some of these maybe people are blowing smoke up my ass. I can't say for certain that psionics had been, that psionics over the years had been a controversial subject. Was, um, we just couldn't get it to figure out a way to make it work without either making characters super powerful, diverting something away from the game that already existed. Or allowing now fighters to somehow have magic abilities, which was breaking the idea of having people have to function and cooperate, mm-hmm. or at least have hirelings that fulfilled certain roles. So there was there was definite roles of fighter, magic user, cleric, and it was only with the character types that were non-human that it had more time and whatever that could be parts of those, but they could never get as high in levels and specialization as the humans. Mm -hmm. That was the early game. And so you could play an elf, which I I did in Rob Coots' game. That's the same game that my dad played in uh, because my dad wanted some fun too. It's Mm -hmm. it's as good as Dungeon Mastering is. It's nice once in a while to get down there and you try to min-max somebody else instead of always fighting off the people who are trying to find the holes in the system. (laughs) I I run with lots of people. The last game I just ran had 17 people in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jesus, 17 people. That's like hurting cats. Well, it, it is a little difficult. And I've done 22 before, but at least those guys were all sailors. And they got smart enough that they started assigning people for different kinds of things. One guy would be a battle master. Another mm-hmm. one would be handling provisioning and, and all that stuff, marching. <laughs> they 22 guys went into the into the dungeon for the first time. And by the time that they finished 11 hours plus some minutes afterwards, there was only three of them left, but all three of them went up another level, a point away from third, and each had a, one cool item and maybe one or two lighter stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they left a trail of dead in the dungeon, 19. <laughs> now, with that, with, that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind, um, this, mu- this, might be, this might be a bit of... This might, might be a bit of a of me stretching things, which is not not too far not too far off from how I usually work. I, I may as well be Reed Richards being drawn and quartered. Um, but it, but of of some of the modules that you had that you had te- that you had tested run run and the like, um, which one which ones were your st- which ones were your standout um, favorites? See, that's that's always a question because all I play tested were my dad's modules. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, then other products that would be Boot Hill products, uh, Metamorphosis Alpha products, mm-hmm. Warriors of Mars game. I played Knights of Camelot, Divine Right. Mm-hmm. Anything that was made, I played Air Power. I played Fight in the Skies. I, mm-hmm. I played everything. I had input in things. Not so much with Fight in the Skies. Mike Carr started that real early. Mike Carr is a is a great designer and a, and a fine organizer. And he was mm-hmm. a big part of TSR in his own right. Uh, now, I'm just, yeah, go ahead. Now, I'd like to I'd like to shift gears a li- a little bit in re- regards to a regards to a project that I saw frequently when I was do- when I was doing my research, and that is the Lost City of Gaxmore. All right, that's a lot of fun. Which that's, um, there have which there have been three different versions. Yeah, there was. There was a there was a D twenty there was a, a D twenty system version in two thousand two, a version using Castles and Crusade in two thousand fifteen, 
and most recent and most rec the most recent iteration that I've seen um, was from this year uh, as, as it was um, in D and D fifth edition. Yes, and that that really went over very well. And there's there's lots of copies of that. And what I like is the idea that the game has to be the way I created it. I didn't do the transformation. Mm -hmm. But if it's anything like what I created, then there is definite death. There is definite intrigue. There is at least escape mm -hmm. or at least have good chances of the and there's the ability to go up to at least eighth level. We had a bunch of kids. We had an average group of about 13 people playing at the Game Guild, which was Margaret mm -hmm. Rice and Don Parent's store then. And I, I ran that. And on Saturdays at noon, uh, Ken Whitman would come in and, and sub for me. And then I had the rest of the afternoon off to do nothing but run Dungeons and Dragons all afternoon until I felt like quitting or, you know, sometimes as late as 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So that was, that was not bad when you're talking about a bunch of teenagers, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, we've got up to about as high as like eighth level uh, by this time. And we, of course, were not messing around in the, in, the, in the inner city yet. So that's just working with lots of other things. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give too much away, except that it's a, it's a fan, it's a it's a wonderful product with it's a map that that's unbeatable. Alyssa Faden did the best map. She actually made corrections on this map that the troll lords had missed earlier. She read my material and said, "Wait, there's no 67 here, <laughs> and then 68 doesn't look like it's described." <laughs> this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So for a purist, all of a sudden, it's like saying, "Oh, they wiped off the smudges off the painting." <laughs> got it right yeah. uh, so I'm very pleased with Alyssa and mm -hmm. then besides that God bless her she gave me a giant size canvas copy of the map she created and it's on my wall in my dining room where we play games off mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's wonderful beautiful yeah. and Lost City Gaxmore mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a it's an A quality at least an A minus something mm -hmm. like that I mean you a lot of people might think there's too much hack and slash but there's, it doesn't have to be all that. But, of course, that's what the original game was. It was a lot of using your intelligence, the best assets, uh, setting up, preparation, uh, unification, you know, potentially having things readied and then cutting a bunch of tree limbs loose and hurling stuff. Who knows? I'm just trying mm -hmm. to say planning or, or setting up trip wires and things and somehow faking wounded in front of a giant or mm -hmm. something that comes rushing along and then it falls into the pit and you pour the oils in there and you light them on fire with, and there's spikes in the bottom. I'm, I'm just trying to give you the most mm -hmm. where yeah. you, you can overcome something that's way above you by using cunning and power. I guess kind of like supposedly cavemen were doing with uh, mastodon herds and such. Well, you know, getting off cliff edges. It's it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm one to talk, given how the more my more infamous um, memory with my with my early days with D and D was when I invented what 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 would be later known as the up button. Okay. Because because I ended up I ended up taking because I wanted to play a rogue who was who was good at traps, and I stole I stole way too many ideas from Looney Tunes. Okay. The well, whole idea sure. with the up button is it is a essentially a rune trap. You place it you place it on a you place it on the ground. Anybody who step anybody who steps it within its area of of effect is treated as if they cast fly on themselves straight up for six seconds. Okay, and if they don't have a ring of feather falling or levitation or something. Well, the thing the thing is, I I forgot to write in what would happen if the, if there is a obstruction, say a ceiling. Okay. Well, then and then and how much force, how much weight can it pick up? The answer yeah, to that question is yes. <laughs> yeah, it should it should be dependent upon the caster's level. It tec it technically should, but the problem is I forgot to write that in. So they so it was just improvised that what whatever steps on the thing um and ends up go ends up going up for ends up going up for four, um 40 miles per hour for 6 seconds. 
Okay, it's, now is this is this a computer game or something? I mean, I'm trying to say, why can't you just go in there and, and say with uh, 800 pounds of force or something? Or um, what ended up ha- what ended up happening? Because I only used this thing once, and then it was, and then my GM said that was a brilliant idea. Never do that again. Is he had he had set up a dra- he had set up a encounter with a black dragon at the at the end of a dungeon that he'd created, and. As I saw the thing approach, I said, "He just stepped where I put my trap," and <laughs> the, he's and he's looking at it going, "Yeah, but he's too heavy." That doesn't matter. I didn't put I didn't put that in the I didn't put that in the rules. He's going up, uh, but there's the a ceiling DM, up there. That doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the, the DM should be able to say that it doesn't matter because there is a weight limit. He should be able to make that decision if it's his game. He ended up calling an audible, and the dragon was crushed to death. <laughs> okay, I. All right, and, and you and you sound proud, but I think that the DM just was was young or not experienced enough. None of us were all that. Ex- none of us were all that experienced. We were all flying by the seat of our pants. Because... Okay, well, yes, I, my very first dungeon was ended up being nothing but a, of the angry villagers fighting monsters mm-hmm. in the town. So uh, we grow. <laughs> yeah. We we get better by practice, as well as by sharing ideas. And there's some stealing, not deep, but I mean, we all we blend. And the more we do stuff, we either like it or we stop doing it. You know, we stop. Mm-hmm. There's nobody forcing you to go to your games. Yeah, or your activities. The, the old say, the old saying is, if you steal from one person, that's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen pers- people, that's research. <laughs> okay, a um, research paper. Yes. Yeah. But with keeping keeping that in mind, um, one other thing that I want one other thing that I wanted to to a, to ask to ask about is the is um the pro, the project reg, the project regarding a reg, regarding the museum. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, how did the, how did that come about? How it came about was really actually pretty cool because it took um, again lots of factors. Recently, many people are trying to say without Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, blah, 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 we wouldn't have DD, and that's true. Um, with the museum, uh, the interest levels in Lake Geneva for its gaming history had be- have been low, even though we've been pushing it. And finally, now, but and hopefully this will pan out, but because today is a vote for the zoning on the museum, Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's not the council vote; it's just the planning commission. But the work is done. Mm-hmm. What ha- but but back up a couple years ago in November, when um, Geek Nation Tours was doing the uh, classic RPG retreat Lake Geneva as a as a first time thing, and mm-hmm. I was the primary uh, dungeon master. Uh, and then we, I brought in Jim Ward, mm-hmm. and I also brought in Jeff Leeson. Those were the, the prime when we all, so all three of us would be running something each day for six days in a row. Mm-hmm. And if, uh, if there, well, Jim Ward wasn't able to do all that many days, but when he wasn't, we either picked up some extra people in our games or else they could, Tom Wom showed up. So you would have board gaming. So this is gaming camp, mm-hmm. and we're going to be doing these Geek Nation tours again. But aside from my just doing a spiel about how cool the Geek Nation tours are for about thirty five hundred dollars, okay. Anyway, <laughs> during this, I was looking at the seven twenty three William Street building, which was now divided into two apartments, and always lots of cars with trash and no maintenance on the building. And the people only spoke Spanish. Uh, this place was starting to get run down. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is such a pity because as I'm talking, this place has so much history. And I started giving the whole spiel about this building and everything. And I said, this place should be a museum or a game company. Mm-hmm. And Justin Lanasa in the audience listened to me. And then as as soon as he got home, he contacted a realtor just a 
one somewhere in Lake Geneva, just randomly, you know, doing, letting the fingers do the walking or, no, you know, the idea of, okay, these ones show up, I'll pick this one. And he said, I need some help. He said, do you th would you like to make a commission helping me, you know, pick up a building? And they said, oh, yes. <laughs> he says, find out if this building's for sale and say that, um, that there's someone who's very interested mm -hmm. and a, a price was able to be worked out which was higher than what Justin wanted and lower than what she had wanted. <laughs> so anyway, that's how the building came about. Mm -hmm. Then he said, I've just picked up the building, Ernie. You said that you wish someone would. He said, well, you'll be part of it with me. And I said, you damn tootin'. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he said, you know, and he said, well, you know, but this other guy that I know, Jeff Leeson, and I, Jeff Leeson's one of my best friends because we'd all been talking and all excited to be, be seeing him doing it during the tour and talking to him as well as he was a good tipper at the end of the tour <laughs> which is another amazing thing mm -hmm. uh I, I didn't know in the tour industry that when you're through and you're like shaking hands or whatever else lots of times people will be slipping you you know a couple c notes or something it's like whoa <laughs> mm -hmm. that was that was the start of a whole new life saying hey this this might not be all bad mm -hmm. um but anyway the three of us made a partnership and with that we've decided that we have the building we don't want just another hobby shop uh, we and at the same time it's not just going to be a, ga a game production place though hopefully we will be doing some of that uh, to what scale or whether it'll be lots of licensing but hope we want to do some work ourselves and and or maybe have other people's bring in incredible ideas and we can polish them work with them and there could be royalties whatever just the old-fashioned as, as so many games that tsr had before mm -hmm. but the first step was the museum now i already was involved in a project i'm even wearing the t-shirt from it right now and it's the giant lands mm -hmm. t-shirt and my friend jim ward who i've known for a long, long time. In fact, I spent three a three week vacation up visiting with him and his three children up in Prairie du Chien when he was a school teacher when I turned eighteen. So that should give you an idea about how long ago, hmm. like forty three years. Um, and um, just getting lost a little bit there with Jim Ward. So I'll. Go ahead and, and give me another focus here. I'm yeah. <laughs> so I'm lost in the past. We can't. We kind of talked about it before before we went live. But oh, I I'd, I'd like to I'd like to get your your feel when you first um when you first found out about the whole Giant Lands um project. Well, it's it's really it's really exciting, and that's why I got involved because it's it's another it's another game system done with uh, a lot of native american or american indian is whatever you want to call it uh influence and or first nation christ there's all <laughs> i don't know what to say um but i'm particularly impressed by some of the art that has to do with aztecs riding around in hovercraft mm -hmm. <laughs> and so not only did it have jim ward involved that's why i got involved with jim ward all right, because Jim Ward somehow said, you know, I'd like it if like Ernie was involved in this. He actually gave me some sort of a little thing. And I said, well, OK, let's take a look. And then I got to meet Stephen Dinehart and he's he's totally committed. And he's someone who who has a, a fresh view. Now. It has to be still tested out in, in battle, let's say, but. Uh, all in all, this view of like an intelligent, I like this idea of an intelligent planet. But a planet is like a tree in that its actions and reactions, while very powerful, are slow. And somehow it has reacted badly to all this contagion, pollution, atomic warfare, whatever's been happening and has occurred. In your campaign, you'll get to set that up. But you have some sort of storyline to start with, but it's not complete. It's just... Right now, it's a it's a it's an outline, and if you want to do like the old fashioned Dungeons and Dragons, you would then fill it out so you could make it like Hyrule's Journey if you wanted to in Northern Canada, 
and Minnesota leading down into Wisconsin all the way to Pittsburgh or whatever mm -hmm. around the Great Lakes. If you want to have that kind of fun, I think he did something like that. Um, but uh, at the same time, I'm sure at some point they'll start to be modules and things. So that's the difference. When you said about first edition to before that is that modules were not the important part of the game. It was, would you like to try something that somebody else has made? This is a master who's done it. Mm -hmm. But people mostly made their own material. By the time we started getting a unified viewpoint of how to play, which was first edition, mm -hmm. where the DM didn't quite have as much uh, godhood or or just power. He, he still had some 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 rules are at least very strong and intelligent guidelines but on on a on a time that if he ever wants to make a hard decision he should he can say no this this is the way it's going but he's got to live with that and if if something ticks off your players and you do like something like that repeatedly you do more to their eyes boneheaded decisions and things aren't fun they will stop playing so mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons is not something where you're paying or having to go to. It's something you willingly go to and share with friends. And the, the, the best time is had when everybody has a good time. Mm -hmm. So even as a thief, I would hope, but it, again, you know, you're saying as a character, mm -hmm. uh, it's not always stealing the best item. And sometimes it might even be funny, like switching an item from one player to another. <laughs> or, you know... Just other odds and ends. That you, it's the idea of of having your that's that's the fun of your role playing. And instead of having that as a character description, you create that by the actions you do and how you choose to play your character. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between like a first edition and more of a modern fifth edition thing where you're out. You know, there's a lot more. The groundwork is really laid out and. Mm -hmm. And also there's there's so much more of a variation because in the past you had to be at least a humanoid uh, to be a player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No no dragonborn. <laughs> no. <laughs> and definitely no drows. Drows were always supposed to be chaotic evil. There shouldn't be a drizit, but it's worked very well for the man. Mm -hmm. But uh it's they're supposed to be like partially uh they're creatures of chaos that that just love uh, new and utterly intriguing ways of torture or whatever, or finagling or lying, cheating, stealing, conniving, um, that sort of thing. So they should yeah. never, never be the player character <laughs> unless they want to play Snidely Whiplash, a villain or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, -uh. <laughs> well, I've, I um, I can, I can definitely, I can definitely, I can definitely see. See that though, um, I've I've always believe I've always been a firm believer in um in rules in rule zero, which means that that uh, there are no rules or just um or is rules the way rule zero is written tends to tends to vary depending on what book you're looking at. But the most consistent definition that I've gone with is the rules are here for entertainment. If a rule is getting in the way of the entertainment, throw it out. Yes, but that should be the DM's job, not mm -hmm. the players. Usually, I um, I have ha I have had to do I have I have entertained the idea of opening up a forever DM support group, mostly because <laughs> I mostly because I ended up getting stuck with the role because nobody else had the gu had the guts to actually um actually take up the GM chair, and then <laughs> and then once I did when I did it for take a while everybody screen. everybody decided to not do it because they thought. They thought, well, we can't do it as good as you, as you, so you got to do it. <laughs> I ended up being too good at my own job. Well, but you see, the way to get out of that then is to uh, give someone a gift of a of a game that's not Dungeons and Dragons. Intriguing. So maybe this Giant Lands will be for your one of your buddies. Let's. But at this point, with Giant Lands, mm -hmm. and I, that's, we're working. Uh, Stephen would like me to be spending more time on it. Part of the problem is, is that his very putting out the information that uh, TSR is out there and that we're going to be making games 
is forcing me to be on the computer eight to 14 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. that Yeah. That's the thing. I, um, now so, I, I had, now I had a bit of a privilege to, to, to know about, to know at least tangentially that, th that, that there was, that this, t that this, t that this new TSR was, go was going to be a thing. But, um, in the last, week it's it seems that it seems that everybody's had a had to say something on it and a lot of people are treating this like el like elwood blues getting the band back together which um i don't know, <laughs> maybe, I don't know maybe, you well. could, maybe you could pull off um so you were all you were talking about the whole suits thing earlier maybe you could put maybe you could pull off sunglasses and a fedora <laughs> well as long as someone else can play the harmonica i could be up there but I would I would have to have a chair or something. I have bone on bone knees. I can't stand very long. But I could do a little bit of dancing, but I can't go sideways <laughs> very well. But, you know, I'm 61 years of age. That's why I have all these good stories to tell about Dungeons and Dragons. I got I was a front row seat as a little kid. Mm -hmm. And I never try to turn away little kids. I always try to encourage and allow them to play at our tables. And I like it best when their parents are somewhere near too. Mm -hmm. But I but I also want to give them their own chance to their own rope to hang themselves with and they can die, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it really blatant. And I'll say, are you sure you want to do that sort of thing? Do you know? And I said, you know, that lion is pretty big or whatever else, but boy, he's probably worth a lot of, you know, etc. So I give them the A or B and lots of times the young people are very brave. Yeah. The, the line that I, t the line that I end up using with, with my players and when I, whenever I do guest work is, Okay, on a scale from one to invading Russia in winter, how confident are you in this idea? <laughs> um, plus, there's there's the fact that I had I um I had taking a cue from Wayne's World, I put up a I put up a sign on the wall that that says that has the mo that has the official mantra of my monastery: "The dice gods show no mercy." Amen. Because <laughs> I. I've I find the dice to be a to be a exemplar of equality. It does not matter your age, race, career path, background, gender, gender identity, occupation, former occupation. The dice gods hate you. See, you know, I I believe that the dice work well for me as long as I can roll them. I can roll them far, but I have to touch them and I have to put the magic in. I gotta throw the dice. Are you and not? Not in a dice tower. Do you do you also ascribe to the idea of do not touch do not touch anyone else's dice? I um no no, but I but I still like my dice to be at home, and I don't like them to take to take traveling trips <laughs> in other people's dice bags. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> but saying... I do have one Minnesota fan that <laughs> that I we bet on our teams, and it's only a dollar. But if if one side sweeps, the other man gets to at GaryCon gets to pull a die out of the dice bag, and keep it. So I've I've got a die so far and two bucks. Well, obviously you're smarter than me when it comes to sports bets because the last time I did that, I ended, I ended up having to eat the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> so, obvious. Like I said, you you're making better decisions than I am. All it would cost me is a die. I have lots of die. <laughs> Some of them are better than others, though. I've... You might have, might have to pull out the secondary bag or something. But... <laughs> do you still have it? Do you still have any of those? Any of those? Er, any of those early? Any of those early um, dice dragon dice? Oh, what well, dra the dragon dice? I gave all my dragon dice to a little kid in the 1990s across the street. Oh, I I, I, I gave them all away. I do as well as my whole Spellfire collection. I remember, I remember talking. I remember talking about Spellfire when I had when I when I had J when I had James on. Yeah. Um, that was... Yeah, he's he's quite proud of Spellfire. Oh yeah. Even though it's it's not remembered well, but it, it was a, it was a fun game. But it's just that magic just was overwhelming. It it you know Spellfire was a was a good product, and it would have been great if it would have hit hit first. I think. Okay. I think the I think the other thing is that um. Um, and I've I've seen this a lot with some of the games that tr that tried to that tried to go toe to toe with um with Magic. A lot of them didn't. A lot of them didn't have the same level of simplicity. But but I mean, the good players find all the different interesting combinations 
and the, the quickest ones that can get those combinations while the assortments are still in tournament play. Mm -hmm. See, that's where they made their genius is by, by making it so that There's, you have to continually modify your cards selections, yeah. you There's, know, well, cardboard well, crack. <laughs> that that and that and that and the fact that because of the because of how, because of how they set it up there's there's an explicit there's an explicit theming that can happen just just based on a character's choice of colors like if somebody's running a black deck no matter no matter if they were running a black deck now or a black deck 10 years ago i can have some general assumptions on how they're going to play they're going to be a sneaky bastard if somebody's running a green deck, they're pro they're probably going to be spamming me with a whole lot with a whole lot of stuff to make it so that I can't whittle down their life all that easy. That kind of thing. Um, okay. Of um, what I'm what I'm saying is that I'm saying is that there were certainly um la there were certainly layers. Um, there's the e there's the easy parts, and then there's the met then there's the meta parts. But I just liked making theme decks. Yeah, and see if you can make them work. Um, and you could never beat the tournament decks on a regular basis, but you could make some incredible. Uh, I, I had a a mermaid, you know, wonderful <laughs> a deck full of mermaid and, mm -hmm. and a few counter spells, but hardly any counter. Which with blue is saying something in the old days, at least. Um, <laughs> I I was what I Lords was. Of um, Lords I, of Atlantis, four Lords of Atlantis. I it's was. A love I was evil enough to the point where I where I actively entertained making sliver decks at one point that everyone despised. Simply be simply because I would just I would just put I would just have it so, yeah you might be able to take out one or two but can you take out twenty? <laughs> um, so are the slivers artifacts? I mean I'm trying to I'm just trying to remember how are they just called slivers? They were they were they were specific they were specific um sliver. There was specific sub. There was specific creature type that was ve that was very good at getting um, spammy. They were ve they were very good at horde tactics. Okay. Um, and because of that, they ended up becoming very infamous to the point where if you brought one of the if you brought one of those kind of decks to ah. matches, everybody in the room hated you. <laughs> um, gr okay. granted, granted, I take that in relish sim simply because of the fact that. I enjoy, I enjoy being the guy who get, who gets heat, but I think I stopped playing about fifth edition. But with with that kind of, with that with that kind of thing in in um, mind, um, when it when it comes to when it comes to this direction for this new for this new um, new t for this new TSR, um, what what was how I'd like to, I'd like you to walk I'd like you to walk me through how the whole thing eat, how the whole thing got started because like how I the said, whole thing the, what do you mean the the uh, idea of the museum of TSR and the logos or what what are you looking the, asking about the idea the idea of the idea of bringing of 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 bringing back the TSR name as a as a means to create games well. We would always want to come out with games, and we were really looking to do it as the Dungeon Hobby Shop. Mm -hmm. But when I use the word we, I'm talking about Justin Lanasa was really doing the footwork. And I would back up anything that he, he finds and that his legal department uh, believes to be the case. And, you know, if like any other position, all things are relative and can be moved. But at mm -hmm. this point, it really looks like we can do many of the things that TSR has left out. And why did they leave these things out? I, you know, at, at some point they stopped caring about the old employees and everything else. Mm -hmm. They, it, it, with Watsy and, and before that with the, Lorraine, whew, it was Lorraine Williams. <laughs> Let me, my, my friend Ken Reek was our first mm -hmm. head of shipping department. And, when he came in, um, he was like thirteenth employee or, or or some such thing. Mm -hmm. um, when Lorraine came in, he actually had a powerful position as the head of shipping. And at some point, she said, "We now have someone who oversees this as all part of manufacturing, and there's no more head of shipping. So if you want to work here, you could just be a shipping clerk at half the pay." And she thought, "Well, you know, 
where he goes. And instead, he kept the job. But this is, you know, TSR was family. And he stayed there to the very end until the TSR left Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So that, um, what, I'm going to just say that what Justin saw, and he talked me into this, is a vision that I put out there for him just as, as, as a tour guide. And I was begging, God, you know, isn't there some man rich enough to come here and rescue this building and bring it back? Bring it back to its glory days. And, and and there was this bright little face back there, Justin's looking at me, saying, I maybe, maybe, you know. And he because he's got a lot of businesses. This is a guy who's who's done this all by the by the seat of the pants, and he steps forward and he p- picks up the hammer and gets a team of people and works on it. He's ex military and he hires ex military people. And they and you should see the work they've done in the dungeon. In fact, you can just come to the dungeon hobby shop. And uh, you can always get there through me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but after tonight, and hopefully next Monday night, we'll be zoned to open, and then we'll have an official opening date, and we'll spread that everywhere for, for the museum. But right now, anybody who wants can just private uh, message me, mm-hmm. and we will we will get you in there and probably even play a game with you and have some fun. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's the two real main reasons that we decided to to get and bring back the original TSR. Part of it was he, he wanted to see that TSR employees, here we are schlucking ourselves a little bit in the tour business <laughs> and, and things like this. And he, want, he wanted to give us a chance and the ability to make a living wage, mm-hmm. creating what we love to play and what we loved to play and what we were good at doing. And that's, that's games, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, the nostalgia has never left, especially for those of us who lived there. I was I was a teenage boy, getting to make the stuff that, as a teenage boy, you were playing, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and being involved in the cutting edge. I was there at the table. I was giving the ideas. I was the guy who made hay spells now aid you. Why? Because I abused the heck out of them. Uh, you know, all kinds of other changes are made because of that. So we wanted to bring back this this good feeling of nostalgia and the history, the true history of Dungeons and Dragons and the roots, where, well, I'll just say orcs are evil and elves aren't necessarily all pretty and shiny and beautiful and nice. No, but they're still they're, jerks. They're chaotic. They're chaotic, but they're 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 basically good, but they're not human. So they should be slightly alien or be like being friends with Vulcans. Would would Based on the Based way on you the- describe it, I'm um, the vibe that the vibe that I end up getting reminded of is the um, ca- is the kind of elves that were in um, Terry Pratchett's work. I uh, Paul Anderson. I don't know if he's too old for you or not, but Paul Anderson did some incredible works, and especially uh, Three Hearts and Three Lions, where the the paladin hero gets uh, tricked into going into the elf hill where one night equals a hundred years of real time Mm -hmm. and he's pulled out of the combat stream and chaos starts winning the eternal battle in his, in his small realm. And then when he comes out, he has to go in search of his Holy sword. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible troll battle. So that's, uh, that's three hearts and three lions. There's another great work called the broken sword. And there's a whole book. There's a whole series of his book of swords. So I'm just saying Paul Anderson, the idea is that the same, like Tolkien read the same works as Paul Anderson, mm-hmm. but Tolkien made them a little more nice and a little more what you'd want to be. Yeah. Rather rather than the the strange ones that have magical powers, but you just can't quite figure out, the, you know, the wee folk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, and leave I, milk out and honey for the fairies yeah. at night, you know, yeah. or the... <laughs> okay. um. Pratch, Pratchett has has in his um di- in his Discworld um series, which is definitely a is def- is a very British kind kind of kind of thing. Um, yeah. he it has goes on el- and on. huh? It goes on and on, kind of like Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> it's like okay, get to the point. No, I. I'm sorry. <laughs> I but. He he has he has elves as a representative of the worst aspects of chaos, whereas the auditors are the worst aspects of order. 
Um, okay. And he plays his he plays his humanity right in the right in the middle. Well, uh, Margaret St. Clair used elves also, and they were kind of tricksters. Mm -hmm. And I think that might have been in the sound of his horn. This is this is stuff I read in the late '60s, early '70s in my dad's collection. So mm -hmm. this is I've never owned Margaret St. Clair's work, though I should look it up again if I can find somewhere and not have to pay forty eight dollars. <laughs> I, um, I remember. I remember. I remember wanting to dig when after learning about Tom. Um, the pedal throne wanting to dig into M.A.R. Barker's work, but then I looked at how much how much one of how much some of the books would cost me, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. You don't you don't have um, Flame Song and the other the other book, uh, uh, the the Man of Gold, I think it is. I have both those. They're both fine novels. Uh, M.A.R. Barker mm -hmm. didn't didn't write as well as many people as my dad didn't when it came to giving the descriptions and making everything making the people mm -hmm. feel alive where you were running around as a people. Mm -hmm. My dad and M.A.R. M.A.R. Barker made it kind of beautiful, detailed story description, but his characters were kind of flat. My dad's characters were full of were energy. There was all combat. It was like a D&D &D game and all that high detail with that. But he, he didn't go into, you know, if you, if you had a, a limp here or, Something else, there, or an attraction for the fair Evely, <laughs> or too yeah. much. <laughs> um, but I can I can definitely say I'll, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that how this um how ev how everything's going to shake going to shake up with this with this t with this iteration of t of TSR. Um, yes, and and, and 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 Giant Lands will be a licensed product of of uh, TSR. Mm -hmm. And at this point, though, we still have to get a hold of it. Yeah. I have access to it, but, but it needs to be a team approach. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're at. And as soon, so I'm guessing I'm guessing that we might postpone it a little longer, but that's going to be Stephen's call completely. Mm -hmm. uh, but not long, but, but just long enough to, to, to really, really, because we want to, as soon as possible, we want to put our stamp on it. And if our stamp's on something, it should represent... The, the standards that we want it doesn't you know and luckily in the old days that meant good fun gaming material but our art was remedial mm -hmm. okay <laughs> very very early very early They're like the first three booklets but it was fun and mm -hmm. it was new uh steven i got elmore that's one of the top five living well or just say artists he's he's right there and and i think tsr probably had three or four of those easily maybe keith parkinson mm -hmm. you know god caldwell's not bad either shit and tramp ba holy christ how many you know so we were blessed with art later and but that was still early in our career way before you started playing mm -hmm. um but this now we have professional art we have i believe it's still going to be a uh, D100 system, at least that's that's what I saw, and it's but it's still being worked on without me at this second. Yeah. Um. And um. What we're gonna go from there, but I see I'm involved, so I want all this to work because I'm kind of like a a corporate dude. Let's just say I've got a percentage of Giant Lands, be it small. I've got a good percentage of TSR and the Dungeon Hobby Shop Museum. I have a small percentage in Gary Khan. You see, I, I want all these things to blend together in one happy family, all growing with each other and and throwing goodies to us <laughs> as time yeah. goes on. And and as will, we have fun. I will certainly be looking forward to to seeing how to seeing how that shakes out and especially how the um what how the how the museum will sh how the museum will shake out and who, and who knows maybe down, maybe down the line I'll um I'll sh I'll I'll try and f I'll try and find a way to ju to jump across the state line to show up. Okay, I thought for a while you were going to be trying to bring a resume. Um, I, I mean everybody wanted to work for TSR in the old days. Um, that was that was a dream thing. It wasn't a bunch of money, but it was like you're working on your on your ho on your hobby. As 
as flattering as that as flattering as that is, I don't th I don't think I'm re I don't think I am re I would be ready to do that kind of thing as I currently am. Plus some. Okay. I think I think I do it. I think I do more than enough with my with my current capacity as a wannabe journalist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm an amateur historian myself. <laughs> that means I can get away with a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I do read and I study and I remember more than the average bear. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's the great thing about gamers. When I'm hanging around with gamers, not only do we have shared interests, but the people. By by interplaying and and sharing our entertainment and things, we make friends. Mm -hmm. Every, I, I just watching a little bit of David Ewalt talk to Google today, and he that was one of the things I totally agree with him. We don't always agree, but uh, but we we really agreed on the idea that some of his best friends in life were made at his gaming table, the friends that have lasted uh, over the over the decades, even through you know whatever life changes and career changes and moving. And whatever these people, you're always happy to see. You try to make contact, and you try to get together and do something once in a while with. And mm -hmm. and hopefully it's not all just going to be computer. Hopefully everybody's going to be face to face again because I, that's where the real interpersonal communication happens. The computer is a wonderful tool and a great assist, but I still think it's like a tool. And it's just like having a great car. You can have the fanciest Lamborghini, whatever else, but I still think. A lot of life is going to be the quality when you step out of that vehicle and do something else. Mm. <laughs> and and role playing, that's where it has to come down to you outwitting or being a team player, your your shared sense of adventure. Because the only reason that I have still are playing and playing Dungeons and Dragons from like nineteen seventy well, I don't know if we count chain mail of like 1970 or something like this with where we were doing all sorts of little hidden things. And we'd have, sometimes we'd have warriors and which would have two, two hits to kill and they'd, and they'd strike at a minus, a minus one from the, the chart as, as a hero on a, on a fantasy combat chart or mm -hmm. also, you know, there was, the, the game was morphing all the time. And, and all these things, and, and the Bronstein, that's that was a, a fabulous idea of now, not only is it, uh, are you dealing with things on a set piece battlefield, but you're also dealing with the potentials of long term campaign games. And that's what happened a lot with our Boot Hill campaign and a few other games. We did some Napoleonics as well as and I uh, did some, um, yeah, we did some Napoleonic games where there'd be all these orders. One player would be the French fleet, one would be the French army. We had some incredible grand fun. We had, we had an invasion, um, an English invasion going on in Ireland because they were trying to stop uh, a whole bunch of, the Portuguese had actually landed and dropped a bunch of muskets and powder and stuff mm -hmm. in Ireland to try to foment a rebellion. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you get when you have independent play and everything's not necessarily following the the, the, the social norms of the day. Yeah. But that was role playing. Mm -hmm. And with all that with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to my temple and enjoy the insanity that ha that happens every day here. Okay. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right. No, I'm afraid if I, if I want to do anything, it's going to be a little closer to Mother Nature than that, my friend. <laughs> All right. But and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>